Okay. Um, yep, so we just record to uh, put this on YouTube so that Michael's students who are in class can watch it afterwards. <laughs> That's the purpose of the recording. <laughs> um, so um, hello, everyone, and thank you for being here. My name is Paul D'Ambrosio, and I teach Chinese philosophy at East China Normal University, where the Sahai Weishia Collaborative Learning Project is based. I want to welcome you all to the 27th event of the Sahai Weishia Collaborative Learning Project. Today, we are hosting a book discussion of Michael Nyland's The Chinese Pleasure Book. Um, I'm actually re really looking for, I know I'm reading something, but I'm honestly very much looking forward to this event um, because we have really great scholars here uh, to talk with Michael. Of course, Professor Michael Nyland is a very great scholar, but also the other scholars we have invited are excellent as well. So, um, uh, of course, we have Professor Michael Nylon, who teaches at University of California, Berkeley. We also have Professor Robin Wong from Loyola Marymount University, Professor Kathleen Higgins from the University of Texas at Austin, and Professor Trenton Wilson from P Princeton University. This book discussion will be two hours and will end promptly at 11 a.m. Beijing time. So we're not going to ask anyone to stay even for five minutes. Mm -hmm. uh, the structure will be as follows. Professor Nyland will briefly outline her book for about 20 minutes or say whatever she wants to say for about mm -hmm. 20 minutes um, and then have a 15 minute discussion which, with each of the participants. We should then have some time at the end for questions from the audience. Uh, our chair this evening is Li Luyao, from, oh, who's a PhD student at Nanyang Technical University. Um, before getting things started and handing them over to Luyao, I want to say a few things about the Sahai Weishia Collaborative Learning Academic Forum. The Sahai Weishia Collaborative Learning Project hopes to distinguish itself from some of the less productive conventional practices we sometimes find in contemporary academia. As posted on our website, we are not interested in milk peacocks, in jerks, or in any form of egoism or self-promotion. We hope to curb all types of aggressive and look at me, I'm smarter than you, or don't I know so much, and similar types of attitudes we sometimes find in academic exchanges. The Sihai Weishia Collaborative Learning Project seeks to accomplish these shifts in orientation during academic exchange by encouraging productive communication, humble discussions, real questions, and responses that are open and honest. We hope to foster environments where people truly learn from and with one another. Um, and I really have to add too that everyone that we've invited here today is really an exemplar of this type of attitude. I think this is probably our most humble and open uh, group that we've ever uh, gathered. So uh, I think it's really going to be a special session. So um, thank you once again, Professors Nyland, Wong, Higgins, and Wilson for making this event happen. It's really a great gathering of people. Um, I'm very happy to hear your discussion, and I hope in the future we can continue to work together. So uh, our chair for this evening or morning or whatever is uh, Li Luyao. Uh, she serves as fellow of the Sahai Weishia Collaborative Learning Project. And she's also the director of our Chinese communications. So she does a lot of work for us. Um, she's a PhD candidate at, of philosophy at Nanyang Technical University. Her research interests include preaching Taoism, preaching Confucianism, and comparative studies between Western philosophy and Eastern philosophy. She's a very promising young scholar, so I think we're going to be seeing a lot more of her in the future. So thank you, Lu Yao. Uh, the floor is yours. Uh, thank you. Oh, sorry. Uh, please. Uh, 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 Sorry, uh, thank you, Professor Dambrosio. Uh, I'm Lu Yao Li from Nanyang Technological University. It's a great honor for me to uh, chair this book discussion. And um, please allow me to introduce Professor Michael Lin uh, first. Uh, 
Professor Michael Nellen is a J.K. Sasser History Chair of University of California, Berkeley, Department of History. Um, she generally writes in three disciplines, the early, uh, early empires in China, a philosophy and art uh, and archaeology. Her current projects include reconstruction of a Han era document classic, a general interest study of forefathers of history, uh, which is nearly done, and a study of the politics of the common good in early China, tentatively entitled The Air We Breathe. Recent, re, uh, recent published book, books include Chang'an 26 BCE, an Augustan Age in China, which substantive comparisons to Rome and Roman Empire, the Chinese player book, and two translations of Yang Xiong's uh, Fa Yan and The Art of War. So we welcome Professor Michael Nea. Thanks very much. I completely forgot that I should give a 20 minute synopsis, but actually I think it's important uh, that I do so to say how this book developed. Um, it developed when I had to, or it began, um, when I had to write um, a, a piece for a feshrift that was to be in honor of Michael Lowy. Um, and so it necessarily had to be rooted in Qin or Han Empire. Those were his fields of expertise. Um, I somehow wanted um, it to be connected with the pleasure of learning, um, uh, especially classical learning, uh, because I'm probably in the field um, I won't say only because of him, but um, certainly he started me um, in the Chen Han history field. And I've remained a historian, not a philosopher. Um, and I think what I mean by that um, is that um, I am rooted in a specific time and place in every one of my works. Um, and that um, I may use those as springboards for my own thoughts, um, but I prefer to have people use them as springboards for their thoughts. Um, I prefer not to mandate this is the way you should read X, Y, and Z. I think the other thing that is worth stating at the outset, and maybe this is because I just wrote a preface um, for a reissue of Herb Fingerette's The Confucius, the Secular as Sacred. Herb told me late in life, which is when I knew him, that his book had been rejected by 16 or 17 publishers. Every single publisher consulted eminent philosophers in the field and they all said, what can somebody outside the field have to tell us? They basically never considered the arguments in the book at all. So um, the reason I bring this up is I think it's good for people to know that, that they should pursue ideas out, um, whether they meet immediate approval or not. Um, and that leads to the fact that for 10 years, I would be invited um, to one conference or another um, to speak about one aspect of what eventually became the pleasure book. Um, and at every single conference but one, I was told pleasure is not a serious topic and no serious scholar should engage in it. You bring shame on the field, literally. That's what I heard at every single conference save one. Um, I thought that's a pretty stupid <laughs> notion. Um, and it reminded me about how much our field has been against all kinds of work, cross-chronological, cross-cultural, um, and um, anything outside a very narrow kind of Protestant reading of the Chinese past. 
So anyway, um, that's where I started. I thought if this many people are this upset about it, maybe it needs to be written. And so I began writing chapters for the pleasure book. Um, some chapters were written and ultimately either repurposed or thrown literally into the garbage can. Um, but it seemed to me that I wanted the book to register two points. Um, one is that um, we shouldn't be talking about joy or happiness. Um, because those are bad translations for what the Chinese themselves were speaking about, joy being typically disembodied and associated with the sublime, um, in other words, a very late uh, early modern concept, um, and um, or a religious, specifically religious concept. Um, and happiness, if um, people look up in their Oxford English Dictionary, um, doesn't mean I can do whatever I want. Um, so life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness means quite specifically, you will pursue whatever opportunity presents itself. Okay, um, so the Chinese were thinking um, that if people are smart enough, um, with rare exceptions, and they always considered those rare exceptions, um, we basically make our own good fortune. Um, and we make it by being reliable partners in communities. Um, and so, um, of course, this ties up with the notion of the common good, and in fact, ultimately has led to lots more reading um, on that topic. I guess the second point I wanted to register was the panoply or the abundance of ways that one can make oneself happy. Um, or feel pleasure, as I would prefer. Um, uh, perhaps you're tone deaf. Well, then music won't do it for you. Um, but maybe friends or books will do it. Maybe the thought of going home suffices to um, bring um, a sense of pleasure to you. I think that's important because contrary to all the stereotypes, the early Chinese thinkers never thought that people were all alike. Um, they celebrated their diversity and knew that to make rules that would induce too much conformity um, would be counterproductive. Um, it would not be good for the stability of the person, the community, um, or um, the realm. So um, those were very important ideas to me, partly because I don't think those ideas are found easily anywhere else except in these early Chinese thinkers. There are bits and pieces of them in Greek and Roman philosophers, yes, um, but um, there are bits and pieces of them in Bernard Williams um, and other um, uh, philosophical greats. But um, by and large, um, people have not talked about enough what makes for security. And the Chinese thought that the worst thing that you could be hit with was insecurity, um, not pain. They wisely realize that pain comes to all of us for good reasons and bad. Uh, we're not paying attention or the car runs over me in the crosswalk at the legal time. Um, many pain is often out of our control. <laughs> um, but what can get us out of the realm of pain um, is certainly feeling uh, as if we belong 
um, in our communities. And those are the communities that we have um, forged, constructed over time. Um, so the book falls in, in separate parts. Um, chapter one is simply trying to get us out of the vocabulary of joy and happiness. And because le and ye are written the same, I confess that I didn't um, skim every single instance of that graph, but I skimmed thousands um, um, to ascertain um, what I thought uh, the Chinese uh, were talking about. Of course, I'm going to think they're talking about bodily pleasure. One of my teachers was Nathan Sivan, um, and he was having me read Chinese medical texts and yin-yang cosmology and all of that. Okay, So that was chapter one. Um, I swiftly went um, on to such topics as friends, music, classical learning, seeing, a very great pleasure to me. Um, and for that, I use Zhuangzi um, and home. Um, so Zhuangzi is a chapter I threw away after having worked for months and months on optics, but I opted <laughs> to put the optics chapter in a feshrith for my teacher, Nathan Sivan. Um, and besides, it really wasn't about pleasure. It was about the metaphor of the bronze mirror um, not being an accurate reflection, but always a blurred or distorted reflection, not like a Woolworth's glass mirror today. So um, that, of course, informed my reading of Zhuangzi, um, but um, I really needed to get into the specific pleasures um, that Zhuangzi associated with seeing. So I tried to make these chapters in the order in which I thought they were written with a large series of chapters in the beginning, um, meaning the so-called warring states philosophers, though they were all rewritten in the Han period, I'm sure. Um, and then specifically um, um, Han notions from Yang Shong um, about the pleasures of reading and classical learning. Uh, specifically the pleasures of coming home in Tao Yuanming and Su Shi. And I wanted to end with Northern Song because, and really I'm not an expert in Southern Song, but it seems to me that once Zhu Xi and the Chung brothers um, become highly influential, we're in a more Buddhist world than we were prior to that. Um, even when Buddhism was around. There's more of a sense of strict hierarchies of value. There's more of a sense of certain things that I think work against the early thinkers' um, notions of pleasure. So I end the book saying, I think the world changes um, uh, with shortly after Sushur, um, who managed to wreak some pleasure until his third and final exile, when I think he was old and ill and things were simply too grim <laughs> for him uh, to continue to write poems um, that discussed pleasure. So that's it. I probably talk way too long. Um, yeah, there we are. <laughs> Uh, thanks, Professor Nylon, for your great talk and the introduction of the book. Uh, so uh, we're uh, going to invite our first commentator, Professor Robin Wang, uh, to give her comments. And Professor Robin Wang is a professor of philosophy and director of Asian 
Pacific Studies at, at Loyola uh, Marymount University, Los Angeles. In addition, she is the 2016 to 2017 um, Bergen, uh, Bergen Fellow at Center for Advanced, Advanced Study uh, in the Behavioral Science, Stanford University. Um, Dr. Wang is the author of Yin Yang, the way of the way of heaven and earth in Chinese thought and culture. The editor of Chinese philosophy in an era of globalization and images of women in Chinese thought and uh, in Chinese thought and culture writings from preaching period to Song Dynasty. She has published many articles and essays and regularly has given presentations in uh, Northern American, European, and Asian. She has also been a consultant for the medium uh, law firms, uh, museums, uh, K uh, K K-12 educators, and healthcare professionals, and was a credit culture consultant for the movie uh, Caricate Kid. <laughs> we all thank you. She all forgot right. you've translated me. <laughs> thank you. <laughs> no, no. Yeah. Uh, okay. Um, I know that we have some uh, another wonderful uh, commentators, and also we have uh, uh, we want really want discussion, and I just uh, uh, want to see just a few words. I think it's a it's a wonderful book. I'm not reading it. I'm actually being lured with it. <laughs> no, it's, not, so it's a, it's a, it's a really lure, the joy, you know, uh, a pleasure to reading this book. I think uh, there's a book. There's uh, so many things I can think about it. I think uh, one I really appreciate that you take up one particular very important and also also it's very unique concept the uh, Chinese lure. Yeah, uh, and uh, to do this uh, comprehensive uh, uh, studies, I think this is one of its own kind. You no know, one uh, has uh, done that, so I really want to um, congratulate the, you and uh, also you. You really pay for the way for for how to do the uh, work in terms of history and the philosophy. So I think you really masterfully uh, did this kind of um, you know uh, synergy. So I, I really enjoy this. So I what what I want really here, I will not go through because you nicely go through each thinkers mm -hmm. and then provide the evidence to see how they are discussed a little. So mm -hmm. I have two questions actually for you because I like to take uh, this opportunity to exchange with you. Mm -hmm. Oh, by the way, I also want to say you really set a good model for young generation to, to follow. And mm -hmm. because you do this salad uh, um, scholarship, you know, there is a uh, good material and then there is a, a lot of reflective uh, um, thinking go through it. So one question, of course, you already talked about that at the beginning, you're seeing this little Chinese law is another enjoyment, but it's rather not a happiness, but rather pleasure. See, as a not native English speaker, I'm really hesitant to use this term pleasure. Mm -hmm. Because pleasure, they immediately in this English context, that we'll get into this sensual. You know, you think about pleasure, most of the people probably go into another way to thinking about the, you know, uh, imagination goes wild. So mm -hmm. I, I think enjoyment, a joy seems it's really good. That we, so, but then somehow you don't do that, you rather do pleasure. I think I, do want to kind of want to clarify a little better how, you know, because in the pleasure, we do have a hedonistic view in Western part or oh, utilitarians, right? Mm -hmm. So greatest the happiness, our uh, greatest the hap pleasures, uh, uh, the calculation Benson's, you know, okay. so, so how that will be together. Ro I'll that. get back to joy, which has a long history in mm. English language. Um, and enjoyment is kind of a weak word um, in um. English, so I never considered it. Um, so um, uh, I got my title from Herb Fingeret, mm. who at the age of over 90 said, well, what you're showing is everything does have a whiff of the sensual. And if you don't use that title, you're an idiot. 
Okay. I see. I then took it to the um, publishers zone, um, which is an amazing publishing house. Um, and I would have thought less hide bound. So they sent me a contract and all of this happened. And we're now on the final versions. Um, and I say, um, okay, I, I'd like to see eventually the cover. And they said, well, we can't show you the cover because we don't know what the title is. I said, as on every contract, the title is the Chinese pleasure book. <laughs> and not the head of the press, but a really wonderful woman editing there said, oh, we can't do that. Everybody will think it's a sex manual. See, I didn't see that. I want, I point to that. You finally, you get the other words out of the good. <laughs> I said, that's their problem, not mine. Mm. And anyone who knows Chinese knows that Mencius, one of the most uptight of all philosophers, said everybody needs food and sex. So, and then, it, yes, yes. You add on the other things we need for a good and full life. So um, when Herb Fingerette said you should do that, and again, when the publisher, and I said, okay, then I'm not publishing it with you. I'll find a publisher. Wow. And I've never done that. I've never just said, no, I'm so committed. One reason I was so committed to this title was in my pre two previous books, one of which was Chang'an 26 BCE, I forget what the other one was, I spent a year and a half arguing for the title I wanted. In the case of Chang'an 26 BCE, their marketers wanted me to have as title a great city in China. That was going to be the title. I said, no, it's not about a great city. And I went back and forth um, for literally a year and a half. So I think I was having it up to here with what other people thought of my titles. Mm -hmm. um, and I don't think I would have said, okay, then I'm just pulling it. I'll go somewhere else. Um, because I had no one else in mind. <laughs> um, but I just thought, if we don't realize that everything they're talking about has this sensual bodily aspect to it, I mean, including book learning, um, Yang Shong compare, said books are sexier than women. Um, you know, it's always there. <laughs> So I think to deny that is to go in a Protestant Christian direction. And I really don't. And of course, Catholics in America are more Protestant than the Protestants. Um, very body denying, very ascetic. That's not what we see until Buddhism. Yeah. Okay. So my, my, my quickly to do, do, do <clears throat> your answer. So I got a, a hold to it. And then I want to come to, to two second question. So basically you want to see you use a pleasure in order to centralize or in order to highlight a uh, body dimensions of love. Is that the, what, that's the main thing. The, so, okay. So I got it. So you actually talk about the love, but you use pleasure because you think there is embodiment, that you betterment, you know, all this type of ideas. So that's the best way yeah, to use They're it. there. So yeah, to they, talk okay. about, hap to use other words is to deny that they're there. The I love. think it was okay. also really important that at that point I was having conversations with Li Zihou. Mm -hmm. And he had done um, a four character phrase that used le, le gan wen hua. Le gan but wen he hua. translated yeah. it in English as a culture of optimism. Yes. And I think that's a terrible translation as I've yeah. written. And he loved that I wrote, it's a terrible translation. He said, you're right. 
Okay. I said okay. it's a pleasure. Of, uh, it's a culture of pleasure. Okay. So, so basically, it's another the words of pleasure still maintain the English connotations, like a sensual and the bodily, you know. It's precisely so because that the because English the word. Yes, exactly. So then you will see that's the perfect the match. Okay, right. I, I am convinced. Okay, okay. good. <laughs> My <laughs> second question actually is this, a um, little bit, probably a little bit abstract. So you can see in order to enjoy, well, in order to really get a full enjoyment of love or being full pleasure of love require the condition, requires basic conditions. So but some very few. Never, yes. But very okay, few. So, Yes. Okay. Very few. So, but I will think uh, I want to make a connection between le and the xin hard mind. Mm -hmm. How this is so seems like if you all put your hard mind in certain conditions, and then you can fully have this le. So then, so that this is how I want to see your connection. Now there is one possible way, and then that's my question. So. One of the things that you can see through the Chinese, uh, this uh, preaching, the text, they all talk about the Tian Di Zhi Xin, hard mind of heaven and the earth, right? right. Tian Di Zhi Xin. And uh, then Ren Xin, uh, a human's heart, hard mind. Xin, I do hard mind. So is that, um, I want to know how this uh, Tian Di Zhi Xin and the human Zhi Xin connected. Okay. Because it seems like in order to have a good human heart mind, you have to align with the heart of a uh, heart and the mind of heaven and the earth. And then you have a better condition to receive or cultivate or the being with the love. Okay. So, I so want to go backwards, but I okay. will be answering your question. Okay. There is a teacher at and Princeton called Brooke Holmes, who does Greek philosophy. Okay. Mm -hmm. And her statement that I heard after doing the pleasure book to me crystallized my sense of things about China. Okay. The one statement was medicine precedes philosophy. Okay. That's true. Okay. We need a, li a life first. Okay. Yeah. In China, Xin is an organ system. It's yes, not yes. a single thing. Yes. And yes. it's certainly not the brain or the mind. Yes. It is an organ system that helps the entire body communicate and regulate um, in a constructive way, meaning making flows better through the yes. body. Yes. So that's how sheen is always described in medical texts. And it's really how it's described in early Chinese cosmology, as you well know. Mm -hmm. So um, the sheen of heaven and earth are pretty much in Han Dynasty described as the cosmos. And remember, cosmos in... English already presupposes an order, mm -hmm. universe is not. Mm -hmm. the, they are form a cosmos with humans in it um, as part of that cosmos. And their goal, and this is stated repeatedly over and over, I'm almost sick of reading it, um, that the goal of heaven and earth are to let things be themselves. Right. To foster their flourishing. Yes. And so if you're a human being, you don't need book learning to possibly know how to foster flourishing. Okay. You don't need, I'm a horrifically bad oboe player. Um, you don't need to be a good musician um, to know how to, uh, that music can enliven you. Right. So the one theme I see across all of the thinkers is they think both 
that we can learn how to enliven ourselves. And we learn that from other people. We learn it from observing things around us. We can learn to enliven ourselves. Um, and we can also learn once we're enlivened to a certain degree to keep to quit insisting that ours is the only way of operating. Okay. Right. Now we're in a world where we can point to some things and just say those are wrong. <laughs> those possibly are evil. Um, but I think most of us are not confronted with those worlds. Most of us need to think, how do we enliven the communities to which we belong? Um, and um, how do we um, bring out in others um, uh, where they want to go with things? Um, that's what good teaching is like, right? You don't make little clones of yourself. Um, right. you uh, hope to produce students that can think on their own yes, um, and that have good values. Yes. So for me, I mean, that sounds incredibly abstract, but in the process of reading, um, uh, one thing I owe my teachers, I can pretty much speed read, which doesn't mean I have to go back. I don't have to go back. I do often and read it more carefully. But but I was speed reading an essay the other day, thinking about Chinese hierarchies and how complex they are. I identified 12 different hierarchies. None of them are the only hierarchy um, um, at a given time and place. Um, uh, many of them are in operation. And so I was reading an old essay on De Zheng, um, uh, good governing, virtuous governing. Um, and um, there are the emperors saying that uh, the masses are their tian, <laughs> that they owe their position to the masses. <laughs> And so what they should allow is to the degree, of course, uh, that it's possible um, in life, um, they should, to the degree that it's possible, foster their diverse aspirations. Okay. Um, and that's why, and this will be in my book on the common good, um, why... Hosave, AFP Hosave, a historian, called early China a proto-welfare state because the government spent a hell of a lot of its resources. It was the richest country in the world at the time, thanks to silk and lacquer. Um, uh, but they didn't spend it on only on palaces. Uh, they spent it on um, subventions, loans to farmers that were then forgiven. In many cases, um, they 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 provided jobs for the disabled. Um, so, um, as gatekeepers, as other things, I mean, they really thought a lot about more than totalistic modern countries think about how to meet people at the level they are at. That said, I'm under no illusions. We think 10% of the people were literate. Um, that's a guess, and it may be higher. That's the figure for the Mediterranean. It may be higher in China um, because more people were registered as city dwellers. And so rudimentary literacy, not Yangshong literacy, um, is of greater advantage um, to city dwellers. Um, so anyway, um, I think I've been deeply impressed by this. Um, and I somehow wanted people to know about it. So one project leads to another. But I am I should tell you that uh, one of the people who's here today, Jen Ye she translated um, the book 
into Chinese. And it took us two or three years of Sunday mornings. And I thought, what's wrong with my book is it's too verbose. It, when I was reading her translation, she's an excellent translator. I thought, this whole paragraph, I just need four characters in classical Chinese to do it. <laughs> Why would I keep talking and talking and talking? So um, if I have a criticism, it's that the book is too damn verbose and it should be simpler. But I felt at the time I had to lay every argument out very carefully. Um, or I love to follow up, but I think I need to go let another two commentators. We follow, follow up, up. Yes. Um, by email. Okay. All, right. okay. <laughs> All right. Thank you very much. Thank I you. Those are great questions. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Professor Robin Wong. And please allow me to introduce as our second commenter. Uh, Professor Kathleen Hingers is from University of Texas at Austin. Uh, Professor Hingers made a real research at continental philosophy, uh, philosophy of the motion, emotions and aesthetics, particularly uh, music as uh, musical aesthetics. She has published a number of books, needs has uh, Zara through, uh, the music of our, our life, uh, a passion for wisdom, uh, comic relief, uh, what needs he re really said, and the music between us is music a universal language. She has edited or co-edited several other books on such topics as Nietzsche, German idealism, aesthetics, ethics, uh, erotic, uh, erotic love, non-Western philosophy, and the philosophy of uh, Robert C. Sel Solomon. Mm. <laughs> Oh, sorry, Professor. Clean, you're you muted. <laughs> That's right. I'm sorry. Um, in your res in response to your uh, self criticism that the book is too verbose, I disagree. I think it uh, draws attention to the pleasures of language, and um, I didn't have the sense that we were going over the same material. Every sentence moved something forward. So I I disagree. Well, thank with you. you. That's that. what I aimed for. I'm I'm not sure I achieved it, but that's what I aimed for. The reading should be a pleasure itself. <laughs> yes, and I think, I mean, certainly from my point of view, it, it was a real pleasure. Um, one of the things that, of course, was in my mind was how this view of pleasure contrasts with some that are more common in Western thought. And since there are many takes on pleasure in Western thought, there were some affinities that I noticed and some lack of affinities also. Mm -hmm. But I think the things that were um, standing out most to me is the way in which pleasure is closely identified with both a kind of atomism of the individual and a sense of um, time in some sense being individual as well in the sense that we're in this moment and the future is another thing, and the past is another thing. And the kind of vision of pleasure that you were suggesting throughout, especially when talking about the importance of sustaining pleasures and how a really pleasurable life involves sustaining pleasures in relationship, um, that just seemed like a very different starting point. And so I was really happy to be led on this journey through different texts dealing with it. I also um, thought that you give short shrift to happiness and joy, however. What you said makes me realize uh, why it is that you wanted to emphasize pleasure. And I, I thought the emphasis was really great and a breath of fresh air. Uh, when I first heard the title, I wondered if it is possible. My goodness, it sounds like I am... Um, speaking a different language. <laughs> this I got this message. Um, so I will hope. I think you're fine on this end anyway. Oh, okay, good. Um, what I was um, thinking about in connection with um, happiness and joy is that 
Oh, no, I was about to say something about your title, the Ple Chinese Pleasure Book. Initially, I thought, is this something like the Kama Sutra? Not in the sense that it's a, a sex manual, but the literal mm -hmm. meaning of Kama is pleasure. And I thought, well, you know, of course, major philosophical traditions should have something to say about pleasure. And um, I was delighted to see that there were not was not just one book dealing with pleasure, but many, many books. And it reminded me also of how much I have enjoyed reading, alas, in translation, um, many classics in Chinese thought, um, like even the Analects beginning with reference to learning Absolutely. and enjoying implementing it and the pleasure of friends coming from far away right. I mean it's just it's just a delightful entry into philosophical exploration and um this seems very, very much in in keeping with that impression but it does seem to me that happiness doesn't necessarily have the connotations um that at least in some of your sentences, you suggested that they do. The happy face idea. Mm -hmm. Okay, I mean, there's a happy meal as well. But I don't know how deeply that is what people tend to associate with. Um, you've gone out just for a minute, so I'm going to answer. I think... And so far as it is viewed as a short term mood, and I shift my position closer to yeah. the router. You know, internet goes in and out all the time. <laughs> I'll begin to answer that, um, giving Kathleen a little bit of time. Um, at UC Berkeley, there is the Happiness Project, and it has been given untold millions. Um, and it tells us that there are only five emotions, and it tells us that, and of course, they're Euro-American emotions. I teach a course with Thomas Krona um, on the emotions. Well, sorry, the emotions are not the same in different cultures and in different times and places. So perhaps I react against happiness because I'm an American. Um, I'm also a firm fan of Barbara Ehrenreich, and her book, Bright Sided, which shows how US corporations have endlessly drummed into ourselves that we are individuals, we shouldn't act collectively. And even if we have cancer, we should either be optimistic so that we can improve our outcomes um, or we should realize that it's because we're pessimists that we have cancer. I think she's very well documented that happiness, and I'm very against a major movement all over the United States, um, and that is people who think um, um, that, oh, they're anarchists, or they're nihilists, or they're this, that, or the other. Um, and they all begin with the fact that they have the right to pursue their own happiness, the January 6th people. Um, so, um, you know, I'm a historian, and I also have a degree in American history. Um, I think about what Americans think happiness means, um, maybe quite a bit more than some other people, and I find it very discouraging. It, it means to most of them, I can do whatever I want. Um, and that is not a rep, if study after study, uh, neuroscientific, psychological, social scientific shows that that is not what happiness means. But the real reason I rejected it is because I think the Chinese thinkers are saying most of us make our a good bit of our own fortunes. And since the oldest meaning of happiness is luck, 
oh happy man means oh lucky man um i didn't want luck on the horizon um so but anyway um i'm willing to say that i understand why people use that but i would like people i'm with ursula le guin words are my matter I would like people to think about the words they use to translate rather than simply taking older translations uh, for granted. So I'm head of a translation series and I'm gonna brag now. I take great pleasure in the fact that two, we've published three volumes, five more are in the works. They have won the MLA prize for the best translation from any language into English for two years. So um, that's because <laughs> I care a lot about words. I'm, I'm the editor. Um, and um, so um, I wrestle one of my, the person who won the other prize called me strenuous, okay? And in the end, He's remained my good friend. He's now working on another book. We're in contact every single day. So um, I think if we think hard about the words, I guess I'm a George Orwell fan. Um, if we think hard about the words we use and philosophers are supposed to do that, um, then I think um, we need to say, is this the best translation we can arrive at for a whole panoply of texts. So yeah. I, I don't disagree with that. Um, I, in fact, think that the audience, I mean, which is obviously what you're considering, the audience is an important factor there too, because what are they going to get out of a translation like happiness? Um, mm -hmm. I just I just think that probably a lot of people think of happiness in a way that is in keeping with the kind of pleasures you're talking about. And I don't preclude that. They can yeah. think of it any damn way they want to. <laughs> <Of course. laughs> as I as I said, I, I like to think I wrote a book that might be a springboard for other people to find other pleasures, you know, <laughs> or to think about what they care about most deeply. Um, and I really don't care about what language they use, um, as long as they're not professionals and as long as they're not <laughs> using some words that I think one, thanks to databases now, can do incredible word searches um, and line up every instance of something. Um, and, and aside from Lu, where I gave up at around 2,000 um, uh, passages, um, that's what I did for basically everything else. So I'm a serious evidence-based person who says, are they using this word in this way? Um, and um, I think it's, I think... I think that's what I'm proudest of. I'm willing to waste all that time um, doing the inglorious work of thinking, what is the best word to translate this? I so. think one of the reasons that I had the reaction I did and joy, I think um, certainly to my ear isn't disembodied. The joy of cooking, the joy of sex, the joy of music, all of these things seem very embodied and also relational. Um, so at um, least I, if you want to use it, it's fine. Um, the reason I don't use joy is um, it has strong religious connotations and a strong emphasis on transcendence in many um, traditions. Mm -hmm. And what I don't think is going on is transcendent. So relational, I would agree with you. I have the joy of cooking in my, and I cook from it all the time. 
but um, I never thought the joy of sex was all that joyful, um, though I certainly oh, bought it. <laughs> Another title that should have been defended. If it had... <laughs> yeah. So in a way, um, I think uh, you, you've written a book on erotic love. I think all love has erotic overtones. Mm. And that's what I think pleasure tends to get at those yeah. strong overtones. Yeah. I I think that the the pleasure of the classics is also something that really comes through loud and clear um, in this book. I often think that um certainly if talking to students, but I think this is a much broader connotation, many people tend to think of a classic as being something that is old and stodgy. Um, but only Absolutely. because they haven't read one recently because why did they get to be classics? Because they're exactly not that. And I Absolutely. thought it was wonderful how you drew attention to the quirky. Uh, I must say that I took especially a special joy at the story of the funeral in which a ruler encouraged everyone to imitate braying donkeys in honor right. of right. <laughs> braying donkeys. Like that one. <laughs> A quirky way. <laughs> uh, I think there's a lot of eccentricity going on in my texts. And I think often that is pushed aside. Um, I'm a farmer's daughter from Kentucky. Um, and I grew up with strong women who were eccentrics, all of them, and encouraged eccentricities. And um, I think I take, and this is short-term delight, but I take a lot of short-term delight in just reading uh, someone as being eccentric <laughs> and, and not destructive. So um, I'm aware of that. Maybe it builds up over time. Um, I love you, Dora Welty. Um, uh, people who think the classics are boring, uh, wow, they haven't read any. I agree. Um, Beowulf, uh, which I read in a, an earlier translation, when Seamus Heaney did it, I literally leapt up from my bed going, this is glorious. Um, and uh, the same was true uh, with another book, um, by uh, Sophia Chappelle um, about um, what are we to do? Um, ethics and um, some of the Greek texts that she was going through. So anyway, I think there's enormous pleasure to be had, partly the pleasure of recognition, partly the pleasure of playing out scenarios like a good novel, um, um, what would I do in this situation, you know? Um, and um, partly as grounding for maybe I'll be in that situation. How do I think about it? Yeah. So I love classical learning. I learned, relearned Latin to do it. My Greek is too bad. I, you know, I can read a low classic because I can go, this word, it's this word, but that's it. <laughs> so, um, yeah, I try to, I think the key to me for a pleasurable life is, and I've just been writing on the environment. Um, all people who write on the environment say what you want is not efficiency, but a surplus. That makes for resilience. And I think I think that's a good life strategy. Um, to have a surplus. Um, my teacher, no, it was Ian e. Foster, um, said in Howard's End um, that when people let you down, you may be thinking of the land. And that's true for me. Um, so, you know, we all fail each other quite regularly, so we should have some backups. <laughs> and I thought that, um, I mean, just my last comment is I thought that the um, ending with 
the discussion of returning home and also this friendship through time, um, though only one party knew about it. Yeah, uh, yes. But it was quite delightful and really brings a lot together. Um, because uh, as I was looking back through the book, there were just so many times in which um, pleasure spilling over into other times or causing one to recall something of value um, or recognizing again, the importance of really fundamental uh, relationships in a person's life, whether those um, are with people that are immediately present or perhaps people that have died, perhaps even centuries before. And just that image of returning home just seemed a kind of um, wellspring that one could continue to draw from. So thank you very much for shaping the book uh, too. <laughs> um, I have to thank a friend of mine for giving brilliant translations. We sat at a bar for many times <laughs> and he's the poet, I'm the prose person. Um, uh, Rick Tibbetts deserves all credit. But if for me, the anchor of the book is home because each of these pleasures gives a sense of belonging. And that is tied, if you're lucky, if we're lucky, um, to home. Um, so um, I think I think you got the root of the book. <laughs> Thank you so much. Um, these are great comments. I look all the more to when Amazon finally delivers your book. <laughs> so, so thank you. I hope we stay in contact. Yes, you too. Okay, good. Yes. Thank you, Professor Higgins. Uh, please allow me to introduce our third commentator, uh, Professor uh, Trinden Wilson. He comes from Princeton University. He's an intellectual, cultural, and political historian of early China. His current book project exam uh, examines political and ethical debates around trust and suspicion from the 3rd century BCE to the 3rd century CE. Uh, the project and his research more broadly exam uh, examine the connection between intellectual and institutional history, including questions of uh, bureaucracy, uh, surveillance, law punishment, amnesty, and luck. In his research, he utilized traditional sources and uh, excavated materials, including the many new legal and administrative documents from China's early empires. His interest, uh, he is interested in the history of Chinese classicism uh, commentary and the intellectual culture of early and medieval periods, especially mystery learning, xuan xue. His work also looks at the interpretation of early Chinese thought and institutions in the early modern or modern world and the writing of Chinese political history. That was, that was way too much. <laughs> um, <laughs> um, hey. But thank you. Um, so yeah, I was um I was thinking about so I the other the most important part of the introduction you didn't say, which is that I spent a decade of my life with Michael at Berkeley. So, <laughs> so, oh, so sorry. I, I, no, no, no. And I was that was the, that was not a. He actually supported me, carrying me down a mountain when I broke my leg. Yes. <laughs> so, um, so, yeah. So I was. Uh, I sort of. I feel like I've sort of seen this book grow up, kind of. You have, you have so, seen this um, book grow up. Yeah, I was, I mean, one of the things that, um, I mean, we've talked about before, but that I keep returning back to, um, and I think it's one of the, so we've talked in the the previous questions I've sort of dealt with, um, in a sense, the, the word, the choice of the word pleasure and the limitations of that choice or potential limitations of that choice. And, and one of the things that I, find really interesting about the setup in the book is the way um, you talk about some of the antonyms of pleasure or of lua. And so 
I think that's page 35, you identify three. So yo, way, and I. So being anxious, worried, and concerned, being in danger, and being grieved by a loss. So and, all swirling yeah. around insecurity. Right. So you use yeah, so you use the word insecurity in the um yeah, in your sort of opening remarks. And I was and I and I I struggle both at a textual level and at a sort of personal mm -hmm. level to put together what that might mean. Mm -hmm. Um that the that the antonym is uh, of pleasure is worry, especially the the issue of worry. And and you end the book um, in the afterward, or I think it's called afterward, right? With the the famous line by Fan Zhong Yen mm -hmm. about um, you know the the gentleman worries before others and takes pleasure after others. So mm -hmm. you're you're the first to worry and the last to take pleasure, <laughs> mm -hmm. which which becomes which, bec which has become a kind of shorthand um, for talking about the one of the major concerns of Chinese thought, which is this kind of yo huan yi shi, this this mm -hmm. consciousness of this 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 sort of worrying consciousness, mm -hmm. and and I and I wonder what your take is on that. I, because it seems like there's, I mean, there are different ways that we might put that together. You might say, well, the worry itself could be a pleasure that we might mm -hmm. say, you know, that that one of the things that we take pleasure in in the world is worrying about our loved ones or worrying about mm -hmm. political issues. And you might say that worry is the first step towards pleasure and that if we worry in advance and we'll be able to have pleasure in the end. Or you might say that. Oh, I wouldn't say that at all. Um, so I know a so lot of people would do that. Together. Yeah. Daniel Boyarin would do that. <laughs> okay. Yeah. But I mean, it's because there's, the, I mean, one of the things that, and I don't think you, I mean, this, we've had this conversation before, but I'll just have this, we can have it out in public now. Right. <laughs> um, but there's a, because there is a, there's the sort of positive take, which is that, you know, life is, filled with worry and that's just the essence of life and that we should be constantly worried and taking care of you know the the people around us and you know other things um but you might you might take you know you might you might reject that um you know a life filled with worry as a way of finding a life filled with pleasure and the example that I would go to I mean is in the I mean, one of the, I think, ironies of the Supreme Pleasure chapter in the Zhuangzi is that he tells the story of the man meeting the skull on the side of the road. Right. And and then he has a dream, right? And, this, and the skull tells him, I would never return to my body in the living world because now I've achieved true mm -hmm. pleasure, right? You know, mm -hmm. it's not even worth coming back to my body to be with my wife and son because right. you know I'm living like I have the pleasures of a king in the right. act and so you might you so so one response to a, a worry-filled life might be to say well I want to have the pleasures that are free of all of those worries well I think that's stupid <laughs> um what <laughs> I think um I said in the five Confucian classics book that the sages, as presented in the documents, work and worry. Um, so we take you, the flood queller, you know, he apparently never even manages uh, except briefly to see his wife and children. I think part of it is that different people will have different ambitions about building the communities they wish to be in. Um, but I think there one takes on worries um, in, a, in a different light than taking on all these anxieties, kind of free floating anxieties. One says, of course, I must make provision for this. Um, maybe I've thought I have to make provision for it because I've seen something that worries me. Um, but I think as one becomes more adept, um, at least according to the Chinese thinkers, 
um, that becomes clearer um, how one can address X, Y, or Z problem. Um, and it's never going to be 100% clear. We know that from the figure of Confucius. We know that from everyone who's ever written about their lives in any details. So what I think is the misplaced worry, and I see this in my students all the time, and I'm sorry it's there, is this misplaced worry thinking they should be perfection. Um, I think that one of the nice things that Chinese thinkers allow us to be, um, and, and not Southern Song, late Ming sages, um, they are too transcendent, they're too lofty, they are too um, detached from the world. Attachment to the world brings uh, a, a degree of worry. Um, but once one realizes that the real thing that one needs to convey is not that people have to be perfect, but that they have to be working on a, a better version of themselves, um, they can do better, um, then I think that should suffice. So one of my favorite slogans late in life, um, because it's in the Tao Te Ching and the Analects and about 12 million other places too, is just Jurdzu, know what is enough. And I think that we, and I think your question is very, in a way, individualistic. Um, and I think my view of my life is much less individualistic. So yes, I worry about X, Y, and Z person and will it get done and this project and that project. But um, I, in a sense, that doesn't destroy my pleasure in things because I know, okay, I've taken on this project, this comes with that. Okay. Um, you're never in a complicated project going to have everyone performing 100% of what you'd hoped for with them. Um, you're never in your own work when you finished it. You're never satisfied with it. Five years later, if you reread it, I don't reread my work, but I know, oh, no, I that wasn't that wasn't really adequate, what I said. But it doesn't lead to tremendous self-berating. My job is to be do better the next time. So I'm tremendously long-term oriented. I began at this point. I couldn't even read classical Chinese. I certainly never taught anybody what to do. Um, and... You know, in high school, I was, I won the prize in my boarding school, um, not for being the best student, but the student who had made the most progress. <laughs> and I loved my headmistress. And I thought, if I can just throughout my life, look back every six months and say, I know something I didn't know. I've deepened some relation that was in danger of fraying or that hadn't even been there before. Um, you know, that's enough for me. Um, so maybe, um, yeah, I think um, maybe because I rely on many sources of pleasure, including my spectacular students <laughs> like you, um, um, I think it's enough. It's enough. Um, so, um, you're young, you have a young kid, you have, you know, a, a new job, you have all kinds of other sets of worries that are inherently, I think, perceived as more individualistic or more time dated. Um, but you're in this for the long haul. 
Um, and so I think what my teachers instilled in me and all of them um, to a degree um, instilled this in me, um, you're not writing for anything but self-exploration because if you can explain something to yourself really well, it will benefit others. So there was neither one side nor the other. So it's my job to strive with each project and I each project has entailed untold amounts of worry for myself and for others. But if I think in the end, the product is going to be good, I think I don't spend much time thinking about this is a pain in the neck. Last night, I found myself counting the number of characters in the punishments chapter of the book of documents. <laughs> because they found they published one strip and if that strip is characteristic of the 34 other strips, the piece they found can only have, at a great maximum, unlikely to achieve this, 850 characters. The punishment has more. Okay. So this is the kind of tedious work I do all the time. And... Um, there was a woman who was named Inez Fung, who is a spectacular atmospheric scientist. And I went to her lecture and I thought, I do atmospherics too. Um, and anyway, one of her students, a graduate student said, well, now that you've laid out all the big ideas, where are the big ideas for my generation? And she said, that's not how it works. <laughs> It's kind of brick by brick by brick by brick. And you never know when you finally constructed something that is stable. So, and Carlos Noreña, who also taught you, um, um, I think, um, he said, if you're in the classics field and you miss three years of reading, you can survive if you're in the early China field and you miss three months of reading, you're probably behind and it probably shows, right? So there are times I feel like the white queen, but I love what I do. So I don't, after I complain, to myself or trusted others, I just get on with it. You know, I don't expend a lot of energy. I just do it. So, anyway, well, on the on the, um, uh, on the metaphor of laying bricks, you know, one of the one of the lines from the Zhuangzi that um, gets that doesn't exist in our edition of the Zhuangzi, but it's quoted everywhere in medieval sources, is that life is corvée labor. Um, which, <laughs> which, well, you know, may, 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 I think may, there's may a reason <laughs> why people sometimes are attracted to this view of life. Mm -hmm. Um, I think, um, I don't think Zhuangzi wants us to end there. Mm -hmm. I think it Zhuangzi wants us to see that life often is corvée labor, but partly because we make it be that way. We engage in petty quarrels. Mm -hmm. uh, we stand up for petty principles. Um, I'm all for standing up for a really solid um, principle, but I'm not for, I'm, I'm for getting rid of the egotism. And I think Zhuangzi was too. Um, a metaphor I prefer to Corvée labor in Zhuangzi um, is the metaphor of swimming, partly because I used to be a, a really good swimmer. Um, and um, it's trusting to the water. How many of us do not trust to the water we swim in? Um, and I think it's worth thinking about the degree to which we can trust in the water we swim in. 
um, and then swim more easily. So I, I used to teach swimming to people and children have no problem. It's adults who overthink everything. Um, trying to get them to float in the water, that can take days or weeks. They are sure the water will not hold them. Mm. So uh, for me, that's a good metaphor. I don't know how we are on time. I was going to ask one other question, but... Um, um, I think we're yeah. probably okay. Um, one yeah, we 36 was... minutes. Yeah. So one of the... Uh, this is a kind of long-standing conversation piece between us two, I think. But um, um, so in the in the Shunza chapter in this book, um, you talk about um, the sumptuary regulations that are part of Shunza's picture of the good society, mm -hmm. um, and and it, and there's a there's a and behind that are the distinctions that exist that mark the social hierarchy. So different people and the different social statuses are permitted to wear different garments and use different things. And so Yeah, forth. but that's not Schwinz's purpose for them. Right. But <laughs> why so I guess is there is there a so maybe a two part question. One is is that kind of distinction um, that's based on status and the types of things that one can take pleasure in a necessary part of a flourishing society? Um, and if and is there is there a sort of modern way of having sumptuary regulations? Oh, or we have some, them. Or, or, or something Come like on. that. We have them. You live. Oh. You're in the middle of that, okay? Um, no, I think, um, let me backtrack. Um, Schwinze is invested in sumptuary regulations because in a pre-literate era, what he wants people to identify is good models to emulate. Therefore, he says, one must fun, one must introduce distinctions in order to chun, in order to work together as a common, uh, towards a common goal as a crowd, okay? Mm -hmm. So um, your question for me is way too abstract. My answer to you, and you're in a history department too, um, is name me a society that didn't have um, visual distinctions. The other reason Shunza gives, and I think this is really important, he says we need symbols and spectacles. That is part of what we crave as human beings. That costs money. Mm -hmm. um, and it immediately brings in a division of labor and expertise, levels of expertise, and why is someone the head of the troop and um, someone not the head of the troop. So I think he's getting into a much more interesting argument than we often engage in in America. In America, we say, oh, we don't have hierarchies or we don't like elitism. Well, sorry, whom do we worship as the gods in our pantheon? People like Bill Gates and Elon Musk and, you know, um, people who can show us that they disdain us, <laughs> um, ordinary common people who don't have that much ready cash on hand, okay? Schwinza doesn't live in a class society, he lives in a status society. Um, and there it's not um, mainly about um, cash, but about status, um, but in different and complexly related hierarchies. Um, so I've been reading the Gordian Leoda for my sins, okay? And what I would say is here the editors, and some are better and some are worse, have added in so much stuff into the text and read so many characters as lone characters that read perfectly fine just the way they are, okay? So um, in this... 
the minute they talk about family, they talk about mourning and different divisions of mourning and the utility of having that um, and role playing mm -hmm. um, um, as one cycles through multiple roles in life. Um, so um, anyway, I think this is their preoccupation. Um, I think I grew up on a farm um, and um, I didn't know it, but I was being trained in a kind of view of life that's about conserving and stewardship and all of that. Um, no waste, um, um, all of that. Um, so I think, yes, there were hierarchies. I don't know a single society we can point to where there wasn't a hierarchy. And I read Dawn of Civilization precisely for that, because one of the claims made there, much disputed, is perhaps the Tao Si culture in China didn't have hierarchies. But anyway, I'm not totally convinced. Um, and I don't think we have enough evidence to know. Um, but um, gee, I'd love to find a society that um, thought carefully about hierarchies, because we're going to have them. Some people are prettier, some people are smarter, some people are born uh, with tidy trust funds, uh, we have them. Um, and so um, I would prefer that we think about it carefully rather than saying, can we do away with them? And I think Shunza thinks about it very carefully. We do crave um, symbols and spectacles. They do help us create meaning. Um, so, and sometimes mm -hmm. it's bad meaning, but sometimes it's great meaning, right? <laughs> No, I'm, I mean, I'm, I'm, I follow you up to a point in the sense that, um, you know, one, I, I, I think as a empirical fact, you're right that that societies tend to divide themselves into hierarchies and social roles and so forth. Um, I mean, I don't know if that holds as, if that, if that requires a philosophical defense, I think is a different set of issues, maybe, but, um. Maybe you need people that you can look up to. And so maybe it doesn't have to be a societally recognized hierarchy, but I look up to my great aunt mm -hmm. um, and the way she lived her life. And in many ways, I think I've tried to model myself on that great aunt. Um, so you've already got a hierarchy. I'm the student, she's the teacher. So there, I think we there are destructive hierarchies, no question about it. And there are constructive ways to think about hierarchies and to try to populate our communities with more constructive hierarchies, right? I think there are ways, not perfect ways, but I'm not seeking perfection. <laughs> And and you may now chime in and say, and you'll never get it either. <laughs> no, I, I'm I'm always. I mean, one of the things that um, that I find striking, especially, and it's not, and I feel vindicated a bit because it's not just my um, ignorant American self making this argument, but it's uh, you know ancient texts make this argument. The, you know, there's a constant concern in say the early Han to the early empire um that you know that that the distinction between emperors and everyone else is not that clear and that I mean even Shunza says that there's a there's a kind of desire for everyone to live like sage kings right there are and always so trying to balance everyone should be equal including equal under the law and there are also hierarchies. Yeah, I, I, I think they work harder at this than most societies I know. Mm. So, or most cultures or civilizations I know, and I respect them for it. So, yeah. 
well, I don't want to take up any more time. I know that we should have open discussion. Maybe there will be questions, maybe not. Who knows? Okay. <laughs> we'll see. Yeah. Uh, thank you, Professor Nylon, Professor Wilson. Uh, so is there any other questions or comments or suggestions? Or... Oh. <laughs> oh, there is one uh, on the chat. Right. Thank you. Thank you for the comment. May I see you? I'd love to see you. I don't see you on my screen. So you have There's, to start talking. Person says he's in the wrong, or he or she's in the wrong place with the wrong device. So okay, <laughs> I get it. Oh, I get yeah. it. oh, you read the full thing. Okay. Uh -huh. uh, oh. Yes. Um, no worries. Yes, yes. Uh, yes. Thank you. I appreciate that. Uh, we all need encouragement <laughs> all the time that we're not absolutely crazy. So, um, yeah. So I'm looking. I wanted to ask, did you have some insights about commonalities and differences in views or usages of le? Um, I think the one thing that leaps out at me, and I've been thinking a lot about this because of, um, for Paris, I was asked to write an essay on um, the, to rethink the three chapters about the rule. Um, in the Shirji Hanshu and Ho Hanshu. And when given this assignment, I kind of thought, ooh, I don't really necessarily want to do that again. Um, but rereading them um, many years later is really illuminating. Um, and um, this is a long way to say that I've been thinking about the conflation of Ru and Mo which a young scholar, Ting uh, Mian Li, wrote about, um, that in a lot of texts, these are combined. Um, and yet, when you read them, they're so incredibly different. Um, it is true that a lot of early passages from the documents we find in the Mozu. Um, So he's reading... Um, if not the documents, I doubt the documents, but he's reading independently circulating pieces. Um, and I say he, but that's, you know, clearly compilers uh, long after Mozza, um are doing this um, since they call him Master Mo, which um, I don't think he would have called himself that. Um, so I've been thinking a lot about the rule more distinctions, and of course, the one that leaps out um, at us is Mozart's condemnation of public spectacles and grand court performances of music. And I have to say that when I was an undergraduate, I was a utilitarian, and I thought, yeah, it's a waste of money. Um, and um, even though um, I've always loved classical music and love the opera, et cetera, et cetera, I thought it's a waste of money in a poor um, world. Um, and then I began to think the world is mostly poor at that time because they're spending all their money fighting each other in these endless wars. Um, China is stupendously rich in, from many perspectives um, in the antique world, certainly richer than Greece or Rome in the aggregate. Um, and um, so is it that Mozza thinks that this is not good for uniform training. I, I simply can't, I mean, he says, I, he says what he says, but I can't understand 
really, why he's against that, since most of the troops that we know in the world move to music, um, as well as to flags, um, all of this. Um, I'm simply more and more puzzled by the Mwadza, and I like the Mwadza less and less as time goes on. Um, I think what we overlook, but Yang Shong didn't overlook this, and he, of course, is the beginning of Xuan Xue. Um, he combined a lot of lines from the Analects and from the Zhuangzi. And he said, quite plainly, I borrow from them. Okay. Um, I think he borrowed the most from those two texts. Um, and so what I think we do badly is pigeonhole thinkers in boxes that the thinkers themselves uh, did not use. Um, Schwunze criticizes Zhuangzi, though he says he borrows a lot from him, and there are lines that are identical, um, including their descriptions of what the basic human existence is often like, frantic and frustrated. Um, and they're both telling us, I think, they can do better. But Shunza, of course, puts Mencius and Zhuangzi together as the two most similar ways of approaching how to go through life. So I think we really need to get rid of the boxes that um, were put on these thinkers um, a long time ago. Um, but in rereading the Rulin Zhuan, one of the things that I see is that these famous Ru um, are doing all kinds of things that have nothing to do with the classics <laughs> or with Mencius or the Analects. Um, they're doing astral predictions. They're doing, you know, I could go on and on and on, but they've all been trained in more complex ways. Um, with classical learning perhaps as the core set of insights. But after all, the classics disagree. So um, um, it's uh, what would be the core um, is, I think each person would probably identify the core insights somewhat differently. Um, so... Um, get them out of the boxes. Um, Gu Jiegang said that in the Han period, the Ru could not be well distinguished from the Feng Shi. And um, I think that we can see that even in Eastern Han. So I'm also saying get rid of the narrative that sees increasing Confucianization because I'm a historian and I don't see it. <laughs> so um, I don't see it in my texts, whether they're history texts or whether they're philosophical texts. So maybe um, as Zhuangzi would say, um, let the wind blow through these categories um, and see what sounds they make. Um, anyway long-winded. But anyway, it's a really interesting question. Um, and there were certain thinkers I wanted to get through to through um, to be of use for most readers. Um, and certainly that was uh, Mengzi, uh, uh, Zhuangzi, Xunzi, not necessarily do I believe in that order. Um, but um, I thought there are some ideas that need to be wrestled with if one's interested um, in ancient Chinese philosophy. So if anything, though it threads throughout the book, um, I never really take on the Analex. Um, I, I simply think the Analex is behind everything I'm thinking about. Yeah. Anyway, thank you. Great question. So.
Thank you, Professor Nalan. Uh, is there other comments or questions? Oh, we have a question from Professor Wong. Robin Wong, what do constructive hierarchies look like? I don't think it's me. <laughs> it's not a Robin. It's not a Robin. Yes. Oh, it's Robin Workman. Um, oh. She was my oh. student. Um, and uh, she's one of the best students I've ever had. Um, and um, um, that's a great question, Robin. I think there are constructive hierarchies. I think as I go through life, I have expanded the people that I have taken as models um, and in some sense am in um, the student relationship with. So um, I, I think it doesn't have to be intergenerational. I think it can be within one lifetime. I have had um, incredibly bad chairs I've also had incredibly good chairs, department chairs. Um, and Robin, you knew one of them, Jane Kaplan. Um, at, this was at Bryn Mawr. She thought outside the box. She simply wanted us to think, what would we like to teach? And how would we do that most effectively? Um, I've had, you know, throughout my life, I think most of us have had good and bad models. We, I've had good models in my family. I'm lucky, but sure as shooting, I've seen bad models in close proximity to my family. Um, and I think, um, and here there's the Analex line, and I'll butcher it. But um, the Analex line is when you're in a group of three, um, there are people you can learn from um, and people maybe you want to learn how not to do something. Um, and so, <laughs> and um, so um, I, I think of hierarchies, those are real hierarchies. Um, um, and that one must pay attention to. And then I think when there are destructive hierarchies, we need to work collectively to the degree that it's possible um, to call those hierarchies to task. So I was very involved, for example, at UC Berkeley um, in an anti-bullying paper because I felt in some departments, people were bullying their junior faculty members or bullying people who came from outside. That's a pretty serious word, but when you're coming before tenure and feeling very insecure, you don't need more insecurity. Um, and so um, I worked very hard um, uh, with initiatives like that um, to see that destructive hierarchies um, are called into account. I think in every country and in every time and place and every community, the possibilities for calling out destructive hierarchies very widely. But um, if you're lucky enough to be in a place um, that actually might have colleagues to listen um, or students to listen, one can um, call out bad behavior. Um, and so anyway, um, I'm hesitant to do it, but I do it after the pattern is established. <laughs> I think as with sexual harassment, you're never sure the first time did I mistake something. Um, and I think that's why it's written into law that um, it must be a pattern <laughs> of behavior. Um, and 
um, I helped to write the sexual harassment statement at Bryn Mawr College. Um, and knowing that many of my colleagues had married their students and um, had had happy, productive lives. So it, it's a difficult thing. But I think if we think collectively, um, we can come up with better ideas <laughs> than sometimes are currently being acted on. So I feel that. Yes, thanks. Love that. <laughs> Yeah. Yeah, that's Robin. That's my channel. Oh, is someone speaking? Oh no, I was just I was going to make a a bad uh -huh. Joey joke because there's a I'll put it in the text. <laughs> yeah. there's, a, uh, there's a Joey line that says when three people walk together, one of them has to be cast aside. <laughs> <laughs> and of course, one thinks of that um, being the third, you know, what do we call that? There's a special phrase for that. The third, not third the third wheel. party, third wheel. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, though you mostly need four wheels, but that's another thing. <laughs> we get into that. Yeah. Yeah. Um, thanks, Robin. So, um, yeah. Oh, hmm. sorry. I also have a question, a following up question. Please, I'd love it if you have a question. Uh, yeah, thank you. Uh, I'm wondering, uh, like, as you're talking about the pleasure in different philosophical tradition or different schools, uh, is there like the pleasure in uh, the, uh, the, uh, the pleasure have different functions? I mean, that for some of them, maybe they could just uh, uh, enjoy the pleasure or some of them, they have the player for the ethical purpose or the political purpose or some uh, use the uh, uh like they get the right or, or uh, the good player to make self cultivation or something else i think such... that people are quite different and partly it's what you were brought up with and partly it's what's going on in the current society and partly it's memories and experiences including reading books. So I think, for example, I grew up in a political family. I had assumed I was going to, I went to Stanford saying I'm going to go into the diplomatic service. It took me less than a year to decide I'm not diplomatic. That is not my strength. Um, and I don't mean I was ever in the service. I mean, just reading more about what diplomats do, I said, I'm not diplomatic. Okay, so I'm thrown back, um, what now? So then I um, aim to be in the Stanford program for creative writing. And I really wanted to be a poet. Um, and I was working to achieve that, you have to produce a portfolio. Um, and I realized you're not a good poet, okay? Um, again, I think, and I thank my family for this, I said, okay, what's next? Rather than I'm going to spend the rest of my life, I'm not what I thought I was going to be, I'm not this, I'm not that. Um, I think... And, and I was looking at Robin's thing where she calls me the sage and the goddess. This is Bryn Mawr jokes. Um, but I think it's a really important thing that the early sages in Han Dynasty, what characterized them was their sense of their own imperfection. And so the fact that they were imperfect meant they needed to get their bearings about any real problem from many other people, okay? Um, and I think in a way we've been sold a bill of goods that we should look into ourselves and, you know, their search for some inner authentic core. Henry Rosemont told me, there's no there there. <laughs> and I think he's right. Um, 
as human beings, we want approbation from the right people. And so identifying the right people, which doesn't mean they don't sometimes give you bad advice. Henry gave me very bad advice. He said, you should become a philosopher of history. That was very bad advice. I don't have it in me, okay? <laughs> I'm not interested, it's way too abstract, okay? So, but people will give you bad advice and sometimes you take it and sometimes you don't and sometimes you know quite plainly, this is terrible advice. But I do think that we should have trusted friends and colleagues and teachers whom, and by trusted, I mean, they can tell you, this will not work. I am all the time ignoring what people tell me if I think, oh, it's just common wisdom. This is the standard narrative. I reject it. But my trusted friends look at me and say, this is not you, or think about it. Could you rephrase it <laughs> in a way that would be less combative? That kind of thing. Um, and that's why my, they're my trusted friends. You know, the most important thing about friendship in early China um, was to have someone who would tell you the truth who knew you so well that they could see what you wanted to achieve and they would help you achieve it by either encouraging you or saying, no, no maybe not. That's my partner in the icebox. He's hungry. <laughs> He's the cook tonight. <laughs> so anyway. Yeah. So I don't know whether that helps or even begins to answer the question. But um, I think if you don't fully commit to something, you don't get to a point of saying, I want more than this. I want a more capacious self. And so I always commit 100% to everything. A third of the time, it doesn't work. And what Zhuangzi would say is, go figure. There are no rules here. Try it. But I think one of the things I worry about with anxious students is they're so wanting perfection, they never commit to anything because in the back of their minds, they want to say, well, I probably failed because I didn't try hard enough. No, if I fail, I have failed. Okay, <laughs> absolutely. So that's why I threw the Zhuangzi chapter in the garbage. It was no good. And I started over again. Um, and I do that more often than you would think. <laughs> so anyway, there it is. I think you have to commit fully um, to live, to be enlivened by the process. So, yeah. Oh, yeah, Professor Nene, I'm also like like this reminds me of the uh, essay I'm writing now. It's about the Zhi Ming stuff on the Zhuangzi, also related to like to fully committed to uh what you're doing in your life. And the Zhi is to arrive or to the limit. So the Zhi Ming is like to fully realize or uh, right. uh yeah. To become the best version of yourself. And probably we all have multiple versions. So some of it is just luck. I had this teacher, so I tried this, or I like this sound in the orchestra, so I tried that instrument. Some of it is just luck. 
Um, but um, there's always something to work with. Um, there's a wonderful book of essays um, written by someone who wrote for the New Yorker. And the title of the book is See What You Can Do. <laughs> and you can't see what you can do until you do it. So, yeah. yeah. That's true. Thank you, Professor Nellen, and also thank you, Professor Wang, Professor Hingers, uh, Professor Wilson, and thanks by you all for attending this book discussion. And then, yeah. Yeah, and have... thanks to many people who stayed for quite a long time. Um, I really um, thank you, and I welcome questions. If you send me emails, because I get hundreds of emails a day, just put in the line book discussion or Sihai Wei Xue or something, okay? And then I'll actually open it, okay? <laughs> Thanks. Nice to, to meet some of you um, and um, nice to see old friends as well. Thank you. Thank you. I feel Mom. enlivened. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> yeah. so instead of this being one more chore i feel enlivened thank you <laughs> good questions Talk. Okay. Bye. thank you bye, -bye. bye.